Hello and welcome to Ride Around the Murray. I'd like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri as the traditional custodians of this land to pay my respect and to express my admiration for their elders past and present for they hold the knowledge which includes the stories of this country. My name is Raylene Brown and as a WAM committee member, it's my pleasure to introduce this event as our inaugural Dorothy Simmons Conversation. <laughs> Dorothy Simmons was an Irish-Australian writer and teacher resident in Albury. Her published work includes young adult and historical fiction novels, award-winning short stories, microfiction and poetry. Dottie was involved with Right Around the Murray from the very beginning as an advisory committee member. She shortlisted the short story competitions, volunteered at every festival and was an enthusiastic participant. During her palliative care in 2021, Dottie was a memorable contributor to this festival on an historical fiction panel. Our conversation host is Paul Delgano, who many of you may have heard discussing his own books after the past two days, including his most recent novel, A Country of Eternal Light, and his non-fiction, Prudish Nation. And if you were really lucky, you caught his stereo story last night, which was a cracker. <laughs> at, times, at various times, Paul is also both an editor and writer for numerous publications, including The Conversation, The Guardian, and Australian Book Review. I hand you over to Paul to introduce Kate and their conversation. Uh, um, am I on? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Raylene. I'd also like to pay my respects to the Wiradjuri people and, um, of course, to any Indigenous people who are here with us today. Um, Kate Mildenhall um, almost needs no introduction, but I'll give you a very brief introduction. Um, Kate is the author of Skylarking, a 2016 novel that was named as one of Reading's books, top 10 fiction books that year, uh, and also in 2020, the best-selling novel, uh, The Mother Fault, which was shortlisted uh, for an Aurealis Award, I think that's how you say that word, um, alongside uh, very many other accolades, great reviews, etc. Kate's new book, which we have here, The Hummingbird Effect, is also, um, has come hot out the gates to really um, strong reviews. Kate's in the um, First Time podcast as one of the co-hosts with fellow co-host Catherine Collette. And we're here today to talk about uh, Kate's book, The Hummingbird Effect. So maybe we'll start with a brief round of applause uh, for Kate. Thank you, Paul. Um, Okay, I'm assuming, because people have been buying this book uh, at a rate of knots, that a few people here will be familiar with it, but I thought maybe to start things going, we could have uh, quite a short reading from the book just to set up some of the tone of the book. Excellent. I love this. Settle in. <laughs> have your coffee. I'm just going to read um, from the very beginning, uh, which is a, a voice that is kind of the voice of a river, um, if that makes sense. Before, now, next. Below the surface, through the rippled, roiling waters of us, down, deep down, silver scales flash against a piece of buckled tin tossed in, an old engine grown slick with river muck and weed, and here, snouting forward in the murky dark, what's this? A bundle of rags attracting the bottom dwellers, glide on past before it reveals its innards. Hidey places, deep water places, Rock and mud and quiet secret hush places, river mutter, water whisper, babble, gurgle, seep. Listen, shh, for what we know is back and it is forward, memory and dream. Glide on, glide back, these rag things, a babe come too early, maybe. A mother who knows the river will swallow her secret whole. Flow back. Against the time stream, the land here is busy. It folds, uplifts, erodes until it settles, layers over and upon itself, bedding down for an epoch or two. Flow forward just a little. Volcanoes erupt, lava spewing from thin fissures and vents and spreading across the plains, bulbous pillows where the molten rock hits the cold sea. A meeting place, breaking place. We delta with salt water, make swamp, 
meet other rivers around the edge of the sunk land that will be the bay. The sea rises up again and laps at the place that will be the town. It will not be the last time the sea rises here. Nosing into the bay, a big float spots a staying place, a place to steal, to dream, a built place for a million strangers who will arrive and never stop arriving. Blow rock wide open, carve places so barges can bring sheep, so sheep can hoove land, eat grass, herd upward through tin and steel to slaughter, one after another after another forever and infinity, so that shit and guts and blood run where river ran before. The fish no longer rise like waves, silver glittery, hooked out by hunger, belly up with the poisonous belching of the big louds, gone down, down deep in us to quiet and wait. The first people who tended this land for all time are no longer bemused at the ghost men who devour the land, spread disease, take the children. Here, upstream, downstream, time stream of always, we slide past the banks where you do what you do, we see, we wait. Thank you, Kate. Um, now, this section you've read from, um, I think we're going to get into the different sections in the book. This one goes under the title Before, Now, Next. So unlike other sections of the book, it's not pegged to a specific year. Um, and sorry for the pun, but it, it kind of runs. It's a, current, it's a current through the book, as you said, when you were setting it up. It's a, it's a reverb voice. Um, what's its function for you? What, what is it doing in the book? Why is it there? It's really interesting. Great question, Paul. Um, this voice has been there since the start. So even, and we'll get into talking about this, I conceived of this book as a straight-up historical fiction set in, in one year, very kind of standard mm. um, historical fiction, but in the start, there was this weird, wacky bit that was originally the voice of a fish. And when I submitted it to my agent, she said, hmm, I mean, it's interesting, I like it, uh, but, but what is it? Uh, and it was only as the writing process went on that I realised um, that this idea of deep time, which is something that I got really obsessed with when I was writing The Mother Fault, um, mm. which the, the protagonist of that is, it works in geology. Uh, and so I got obsessed with this reading about deep time and, and how land builds upon itself. Mm. Um, and the kind of idea of, of time stretching out, this is a, this is a novel about time, it, it, it covers kind of 250 years, um, but that idea of, of the slowness of rivers, mm. that eternal nature of a tide uh, coming in um, and how that, can, that could kind of hold the whole book together in a way. Mm. So it, it comes up four times, but rivers in themselves, the Maribyrnong in Footscray, um, where a lot of the book is set, uh, and then another unnamed river where um, some of my protagonists in the future kind of get away when they need to. Mm. Rivers are a key part of, of the story as well. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and I guess, you know, rivers, though they're constant, they are constantly changing as yes. well. Yes. So when you look at one, it's... It, as Buddhists would say, it's not the same river you were looking at five minutes ago, yeah. which I guess chimes with quite a lot that's happening in the book. Um, if you could get into these other sections then, and it's uh, largely to give an overview of the, the various different stories happening in this book. We've talked about before, now, next. What, what are the other main time frames that we're, we're encountering? So the first one uh, is, is 1933 in, in Footscray in the west of Melbourne. Uh, and the protagonists there are two women, Lil and Peggy. And Peggy's quite a young woman. Um, she has her, her folks or her mum's moving out of town. It's during the Depression. Her dad's gone up north to find work. And Peggy decides that she'll stay. She's just got a job at the Meatworks. Uh, and she'll stay and she needs to find a room. So she finds a room with Lil. Uh, who's an older woman who's just lost her mum and is looking for someone to move into the house uh, for a little bit of rent. And this story is based on a, a true story. This is the first part of the novel that I wrote um, of the Anglis Meatworks in, in Footscray, which I became quite obsessed with. Uh, and a, a strike that happened in 1933, which the, the slaughterman did illegally. It wasn't a, a sanctioned strike. Uh, and the slaughterman went on strike against the introduction of the chain system, where, you know, I'm, I'm talking to people who, who I reckon probably know cattle in this part of the world, but the chain is the system um, of slaughter that, that it was introduced, which is now everywhere, um, where instead of a slaughterman who was uh, this trained 
professional, seen as the gods, everyone described them as the gods of the meatwork, um, meatworks, who would, who would do all the cuts on one beast, um, and they had a certain number to do every day. When the chain came in, it was seen as this high efficiency uh, new system for the, for the factory, where each man only did one cut, and the, the sheep or the whatever it was slid across the rail in front of them, and everyone did one cut, and on it went. Um, so it meant that you could get uh, unskilled labourers in to, to do the work. Mm. Uh, the, that strike was unsuccessful completely. The, the chain came in. Um, but I was really interested in the, the archival research that I was doing, which was e extraordinary interviews mm. um, that had been recorded with meat workers about this place uh, and about the community that was formed around the meatworks uh, and, and about these women and the idea of the invisible labour that happens there. So, so that's the story of, of Lil and Peggy in, in 1933. Uh, and that is, is where I began. Uh, but the writing of this novel took place over COVID years or, or moved into those COVID years. And when I was doing all this research on the meatworks, I had it as a, um, a Google alert, you know, meat workers and abattoirs as a Google alert, fun, fun, you know, for what I was getting in my email every day. But as uh, COVID hit, those articles that I started getting were about the impact of, of COVID and the pandemic, particularly on abattoirs and meat workers, mm. because meat workers were uh, essential workers who were still turning up to work because everyone still wanted their sausages and chops, uh, and they were being impacted precisely because of the chain system, which puts you so close to the next person, um, and, and that's how COVID was, was spreading in the US first and, and then here. Uh, and I couldn't get these connections Mm. out of my head. Uh, and so the novel exploded into these other stories too. So the second part of the story is set in 2020 in an aged care residence in Melbourne during lockdown. Uh, and the protagonist is an 86-year-old woman, uh, an ex-scientist called Hilda. Uh, and she's in the early stages of dementia as, as lockdown hits. Uh, and that part of the story is both her memories of, of her life uh, her work uh, and her family, but also the kind of politics and the logistics of of what lockdown means for mm. her. So there's emails from from healthcare workers. There's a WhatsApp chat, um, which probably many of you were in with family, trying to look after people during lockdown, uh, and um, a little bit of hopefully not too triggering COVID talk in 2020. Mm. In 2031, we're back to Footscray, uh, so a little bit into the future. This is a, a fun place that I like to play in terms of my novels. Um, and Lara and Kat are two women. Uh, Lara is a singer whose voice has been damaged, so she's had to take work at a factory called the Want Factory, which is only not out Amazon because I couldn't afford to um, have any litigation against me. It's very much an Amazon factory. Uh, and she takes this job. Uh, she needs the money for rent but also they offer a very attractive health and wellbeing policy, which includes egg freezing and IVF, which is something that happens mm. now. Um, and she wants to have a baby with her, her partner, Kat, or she's ambivalent about it, but that's on the cards. Uh, so that's the, the 2031 story. And then we fast forward in time because I was nothing if not ridiculously ambitious in this book, mm. um, into 2181. And two girls, young sisters called Maz and Onyx, who are diving for remnants of the past in this uh, future world, Australia, but with risen sea levels. So the place they're diving is called New Coast. And the girls live with a, a group of people called the Last Stewards, who are kind of a weird cult. Um, and uh, eventually, as in all good adventure fantasy stories for 10 and 12 year olds, uh, they decide to make a run for it. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> wow. It's a very simple, straightforward Yeah, yes. Yeah. You know, um, what, one of the things I was telling Kate just before we came on is, as I was reading this book, I always kind of put post-it notes in where I think something's interesting or could be followed up, especially if I know I'm going to be speaking to the author. And my copy of the book had so many of those in it that my partner said, you have to take those out. She's going to think you're a psychopath. <laughs> you with that. So there's just, there's endless directions to go when we talk about this book. I mean, mm. each story on its own is, is uh, self-contained, but there are also tendrils, if you like, or filaments connecting them all the way through uh, in big ways and small ways. Um, one of the ones you, you kind of touched upon there was we've got Footscray in 1931, 
and then Footscray in 2030. Uh, no, so Footscray in 1933, Footscray in 1931, yeah. uh, to be precise. Uh, so nearly 100 years between them, and as you mentioned, the, the, the kind of um, original thing that's happening there is the meatworks, they're mm -hmm. becoming more automated, etc. Move on 100 years, and we're in this Amazon-like company where La works, and that kind of automation has obviously moved to a next level, mm. uh, and there are also rumblings and kind of actions towards industrial action around that. Um, as one of the many themes I'd like to discuss, why is that industrial action and, in a way, pe people versus technology mm. happening in the book? Yeah, great question. So one of the things, um, when I first was, was looking at 1933 and the strike, one of the questions that came up, because I'm so interested in the idea of, of progress and what good progress means or what bad progress means, um, or whether progress itself is inherently good or bad, mm. was what if that strike had not been, you know, what if the strike had been successful? What if mm. the chain had never come in? And, and, you know, what if questions are these great gifts for writers? That's what we're doing all the time. But so I was thinking about what if, what if the chain hadn't come in? Um, and thinking also about the idea of strike fiction and um, you know we watched uh, as, as kids and, and through our mm. teen years lots of the kind of British strike stuff like I feel like mm. I know about Thatcher and, mm. and coal mine strikes more than I know anything about Australian kind of strike history and I was mm. quite interested in that and one of the things I did was to go back and look at the history of strike fiction in Australia and read some incredible books um, Mina Kelthorpe's The Die House was, was, is an extraordinary book um, set in Sydney uh, and it's been re-released with a beautiful introduction by Fiona McFarlane. I highly recommend it. Um, but looking at that kind of idea of, of, of unions and, and, mm. and strike fiction and also from a, a purely kind of thinking about the reader experience, how to make that interesting and enjoyable for a reader. Because some of those older books and a lot that came out during the 30s and 40s, um, they're great, but they're dense. And there's a lot of kind of union talk and a lot mm. of meetings uh, in there as well. So I wanted to think about, well, how can I put this in? Um, and I think also one of the things that happened uh, when I first handed the book in, so this is like secrets from the inside that one normally doesn't talk about, is that my publisher said, hmm, yeah, you know, it's good, but what I really want is for the women to rise up, mm. you know, and, and sabotage the meatworks. And I was like, yeah, but that, that didn't happen. You know, like, and in, in, in my historical fiction, at least, my philosophy is to stick where I can to, to the time, the skeleton and, yeah. and where the facts are, and then I can kind of imagine into the gaps. Um, but there were ways in which the women resisted. Mm. They just did it quietly and in different ways, um, the way that women often do. Mm. And, and then in, in 2031, one of the other things that was coming up, up in my feet a lot during those COVID years and more recently is the rise of the unions again. Mm. Um, this idea that for the first time, these Amazon workers in, in the US had joined together when it's illegal to be in a union, but had joined together um, and to kind of form a union and, and use collective action again. Um, you know, mum and dad are both teachers. We spent a lot of time, you know, at protests as kids. Mm. Uh, so I think that there was that idea that I wanted to look at different ways of resistance mm. um, and, and what that means. And it's almost, uh, I mean, it's a through line in the book, but it's a through line in our lives too, that there is, um, you know, collectivism has become uh, almost embarrassing in a lot of circles. Yeah. First of all, probably deliberately pushed down by neoliberalism. Yes but um, even more significantly kind of an embarrassment to be um, branded a socialist or, yes. or you know, a, a union member even. Um, and of course that runs parallel with this idea of atomization, which comes out in Hilda's case when like lots of people, she was stuck in aged care and we're all increasingly alone. Yeah. Um, and I guess looking for ways, looking for signposts to yes. um, some kind of more collective and I think, too, that idea of, you know, looking at Hilda's story in aged care, I mean, in part, that was looking at the, at the labour of aged care workers during that time, because I think one of the things that was so extraordinarily um, frustrating to me at, at that time was looking at the, at the system faults. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a crazy time. It was a difficult time. But the things that were in place which made it so much harder and also the idea, and I know we got this in the media a little bit in, in Melbourne at the time, was this kind of um, 
demonisation of some of the aged care workers who, through no fault of their own really, mm. were, were pulling three or four shifts because so many of the, the health force um, had been forced out of work because of um, they'd been uh, in, in touch with COVID. Uh, and they were inadvertently spreading COVID into different aged care residences. Um, but when I was doing the research for that section, I was really, I tried very hard to get that right. And I had another writer who, Sam Coley, who worked in um, high up in HR and aged care, who did a great read for me on that. You know, that there's a detail in there about women who are going on to shift. It's, it's their third shift of the day you know, they're responsible for 70 people on their own and they've been given one glove. Um, and, and that was true. That, that's what happened. Mm. So this idea that, you know, we could sit on the outside and say, well, this is the problem or I want to visit my mum and, you know, all of these things, but it, it's this absolute ecosystem that, mm. that was happening uh, and, and the workers were, were left out in lots of ways of that equation. And then uh, the, the residents who, who, were, who were locked in their rooms um, yeah. you know, to keep them safe, mm. to keep them safe, um, but just the, the profound impact that that had as well. Yeah, that, uh, that image of the one glove, I didn't realise it was based on reality, yeah. but it says it all, really. Imagine, you know, what does the other hand do? You yeah. know, you're trying to tidy up people's rooms and yeah. at a time of a uh, pandemic as well. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that ties into this, I think, um, and it ties into your discussion yesterday with Greece and Tim too, is the, the role of technology in our lives. Um, now in this book, there are lots of examples of it being for good uh, in the case of IVF and ver mm. various other um, advances, uh, to use that word. But there seems to be an ambivalence throughout the book of whether it's for good, whether it's for bad. Um, what, what was your own way of navigating through that? Yeah, oh, this is, this is so hard. For those of you who were in the session yesterday that I did with um, Grace and Tim and we were talking about AI and, you know, Tim launched into the end, you know, of, of my question to him mm. about AI with, like, this incandescent rage, and mm. which is great. I, I didn't, haven't had incandescent rage um, about the tech in this book. I had incandescent rage about a lot of other things in this book, but, but not about the tech. And, and one of the ways in which I explore it is that there's an algorithm in this book uh, called the Hummingbird Project. And the algorithm was there from the start. So mm. four years ago when I started the book, before ChatGPT was, was the conversation on everyone's lips, um, I had this idea about a code that I wanted to uh, create um, that was a, an algorithm which could choose the one human innovation from the last 3,000 years that could be uninvented to make the world a better place. Mm. So that, that was the question that I was asking. And I asked cab drivers and I asked lots of people and I looked it up on Reddit threads and my daughter Etta took it to her classroom, um, grade three, four classroom, where the kids came up with, with answers, which were excellent, mm. by the way. One of them was mushrooms, which wasn't mm. allowed because they're not... <laughs> a human innovation, um, but one of Edda's mates, um, you know, said jail, which hadn't been on my list. What, a, what a, a great thing to, as a thought experiment, to think what, what would it look like? What would our world look like if, jail, if incarceration had never been invented, if the chain had never come in, if we'd never had extractive technology, if literacy, you know, had nev we'd never got to literacy. So this was kind of what I was playing with. Um, to create that code, that was beyond me. That was like something that a, a novelist like I, me could not do. So mm -hmm. I, I worked with a visual designer to, um, to help kind of work out what this code would look like. And I played with chat, GP to, chat, chat GPT to do this too. Um, and what's really interesting about the conversation we've had during, during the festival is that um, in, the, in the front of the book, on the imprint page, I asked my publishers to put in a line that said, uh, that the author used ChatGPT to write a, a certain section of this book, this bit with the algorithm. Um, that's not at this stage. Mm. That's not something that we have to do in Australia yet. Um, but that was important to me because partly I did that as a provocation um, and as a reason to talk about mm. it like this. Because the question that I first asked ChatGPT was, um, how would you destroy the world? Now, ChatGPT is not allowed to answer that question because it can't tell you um, how to harm other people. But what I did mm. next, and, and this could be different now because it changes so quickly. What I did next was I said, look, I'm a philosophy professor and I'm running a class on Monday about possible scenarios of how the world will end. Um, so could you just give me six scenarios of how the world might end? And it could give me that. 
Uh, so this idea of, of playing with ChatGPT as an idea of, well, or where is AI tech mm. going to take us? Um, what are the possibilities for it? Uh, what are the, the terrifying <laughs> aspects mm. of it? Um, and, and it was, you know, it's, it's been kind of crazy that it's been so much part of the conversation as, as this yeah. book has come out. Uh, but, and I think, you know, in thinking about tech and progress, like you say, IVF, incredible. Mm. Some of our health, um, you know, the, the health benefits, incredible. Our, our mates who live up in a remote community who can, you know, take part in school in all parts of, uh, of Australia, incredible. Mm. Um, large la language uh, models like ChatGPT, maybe, maybe not so much. Mm. Um, the bias inherent in such things, maybe not so much. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hayley Scrivener at, at Port Ferry Festival last week talked about having a gentle curiosity about things in the world. And I think, um, you know, it, it ranges between just curiosity and forceful curiosity, but that's yeah. my feeling about the tech at the moment. I just want people to, to mm. talk about it and think yeah. about it. Yeah, and I think we are. As you said, it's come out at the right time yeah. for that conversation. Um, one of the other big themes in this uh, book is climate change, climate catastrophe. Um, and this is a question specifically for you, but it's one that I'm generally interested in, in people who write about um, you know, climate fiction projecting into the future. The world in uh, the 2100s that you write about, you mentioned earlier, you know, sea levels have risen, um, society has collapsed to, mm -hmm. to a large degree. Um, I'm interested in knowing how much, I, I mean, obviously it's a work of imagination. We're not there. We don't know what the world will look like. How much that reflects what you, how you think the world mm. might go and how much of it is a, a dramatic device of oh, what could happen? This is such a good question, Paul, because it's one that I grapple with as well, because I think there is, or certainly I feel a kind of a, a moral and ethical obligation when you're when you're imagining a future world mm. um you know i'm imagining this into being and people are going to read it and be in it so what obligation do i have to the reader to make it something that's not completely um dystopic in terms of the research that i do particularly in regards to climate stuff i remember being asked this about the mother fault a lot and the, the mother fault involves a, a sailing trip and they take off from darwin and and for some reason people would always um catch on this part where they're leaving from the, the port, um, but they can see the old sailing club under the water. Um, and they would ask me, you know, how did you come up with that? And I was like, I looked at the, the CSIRO map that's got mm -hmm. like sea level rise. And I just looked at the meters and I went, well, that's where the water will be. And to a certain extent for 2181, I did the same thing. And, and partly this is set if people know the, the coastline around um, Lakes Entrance and, and Far East Gippsland. Um, in 2181, the projection, it kind of mid-level projection, so not worst case scenario, um, is that the, the sea will be at Orbost. Um, which, you know, for people who don't know that area is kind of, I don't know, what, 20, 30 k's inland. Um, so, you know, that, that part of it and imagining mm. the, the heat and imagining, um, you know, what, what people will be dealing with, that I try and do as much as I can off, mm. off the science. Um, in terms of the imagining what a kind of society it is. I've been really influenced in, in recent years by the work of Kim Stanley Robinson, and some people might know mm. his work, particularly the Ministry for the Future, which is his most recent work. And in conversation, he talks about this idea of, of moving past the collapse moment. Like, the moment of collapse is kind of boring. We know what happens in the collapse. Like, people behave very, very badly. A lot mm. of people die. Um, there's catastrophes that um, roll into each other, so the human and, and natural um, catastrophes, and then, you know, one lone man walks across the ice to, to save his son in the library with the dog or whatever. Like, you know, we know how that kind of goes. Mm -hmm. um, but what's more interesting is to think, well, there's always going to be this population who survives, uh, you know, in, in most scenarios, even the worst case scenarios. What do they bring forward? Mm. You know, what do you bring forward into this new society? What, what do you want to leave behind? And I was, I was influenced also by the work of um, Jane McGonigal, who's this extraordinary futurist, uh, and she does large-scale scenarios for NATO and, and governments where she asks... She does the what-if game mm. with, with governments. And she says, well, let's think of 100 possible scenarios for what happens for the climate in 50 years in California, for instance. Yeah. Um, because if we can imagine the worst-case scenario, 
we also need to imagine the best case scenario. Mm -hmm. And if we can imagine that, we can take these tiny little steps backwards yeah. to see what change we could, we could make today. Mm. So partly, um, you know, that's what I'm playing with in the, mm. in the 2181 idea. Um, one of the ideas I came up, I thought that I'd come up with was, you know, maybe the humans should just be extinct. Like, yeah. let's just get rid of mm. the humans. And I was like, yes, Mildenhall, good. Like, let's work on that. Let's do a little bit of research around that. Mm. Already exists. There's right. a group called the Voluntary Extinctionists, which you can join and you get a badge. Right. Which might appeal to some people. Mm. Um, uh, and all you have to do is promise that you won't reproduce anymore and that eventually the human race will die out. And, and you know, JP, the kind of cult leader in, mm. in the book, um, is part of that, that kind of group. Uh, yeah. So, you know, wow. have a glass of wine before you do that research because it's a little disconcerting. Yeah, incredible. Um, I was, to be honest, hoping you would say it was all made up. No, all the rest nah, of it, but nah. yeah, cause it's kind Who needs to make stuff up when the world is so crazy? I know. Um, I'm interested in knowing, Kate, uh, your first book was historical fiction set in 1880, um, and your second book, The Mother Fault, uh, was kind of dystopian speculative fiction, is that yeah. correct? Um, this one has both of those things in it, but also just like a whole range of things, contemporary fiction. Um, could the writer who wrote Skylarking have written this book, or is this a, an evolution of Kate Mildenhall? Yeah, great question. Still so disconcerting when people say Kate Wilden Hall. I said to Mum last night, I feel like I have, keep having my name called to the principal's office. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. yes, to return to your question, um, no, I, could, I couldn't have written this book first. I think you learn so much. And, and my first book, Skylarking, I didn't know I was writing a novel. You know, and, and for those of you who are writers, um, the, the joy of not having a publisher or not thinking that your first project might be published is that you just write it. You know, mm. there's this excitement in it. You don't think about the readers necessarily. Um, and, and that was kind of a gift, that, that book, that came from a true story. Um, I didn't... I think the thing that I rejected straight up is, is you know, it, it was random. We were literally camped next to a, a gravesite um, of a, a girl who had died accidentally when she was 18 at a, at a lighthouse. It was like the greatest gift of a story. Um, and so I just followed that. I didn't set out to be a historical fiction mm. writer necessarily. Um, and what, what threw me was the expectation after I released that book and it did quite well, that, that I would just turn out another historical fiction. Um, I'm a little bit uh, contrarian and a mm. bit of a pain in the neck. And I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to stay in that lane. Mm -hmm. um, and... And, you know, The Mother Fault, I didn't intend that necessarily to be speculative. In that one, I wanted to write about a woman who had to leave this country with yeah. her kids because um, I was in the throes of having very little kids. And, and I, the question I was asking in that book was, how can it be that I can find this experience of, of looking after my children and raising them so incredibly difficult, mm. and yet I would you know, die for them. Yeah. Um, and, and so I wanted to look at that. I had to end up making this future Australia for, for the plot to work. So accidental um, speculative fiction. Mm. For this one, what I thought was so extraordinary was that readers who read Skylarking um, came to the mother fault and often would come to me afterwards and say, I would never have read something that I, I thought was set in the future, yeah. um, but I wanted to read your book. And, and so they came with me for that. And I think that trust in your readers um, that, that they can, uh, you know, change genres and can read different things and be introduced um, to different worlds. And also, you know, Tim Napper, who, who we talked, who I talked with yesterday, you know, comes from this sci-fi community. He was like, I can't believe you've got Australian readers who are reading your book. Like, mm -hmm. there's not that history of, of, of sci-fi. Most of his readers are in the UK and the US. But I don't necessarily identify as that. I love that the Aurealis, you know, shortlisted the book. But so I think, I think I kind of enjoy playing with it mm. uh, and also really just being painful to my publisher and seeing how far, mm. how far I can push it. I got a diagram in this book as well, which, yeah. you know, um, I had dinner with uh, Carrie Tiffany, who you might know as uh, the wonderful author of Mateship with, uh, Mateship with Birds, among many other things. And I was talking to her, I said, I, I really want to put a diagram in this, in my new book, but mm. like, how do you do it? Because she's got diagrams in a lot of the hers. And she said, confidence. You know, you just walk in, you say, this is what I want. Uh, and you come with the diagram and you, and you put it in. So mm -hmm. that's how I, 
um, approached <laughs> Ben Ball, my publisher, and delightfully for me, um, I twisted his arm. Yeah, it's a great diagram. It's a great diagram. Yeah, yeah. Um, excellent. Um, we're going to be moving on to questions very soon. The time is rushing past, so I would encourage you to start forming those questions in your head. Um, Kate, I've got four pages of questions I haven't <laughs> asked yet. Um, one of the ones in terms of themes I wanted to ask about before we go to questions was, um, this has been described as a feminist book. Mm. I think your last one was, and I think your first one was. Mm. Um, I, I, it's a question in three parts, really. Do you agree with that characterization? Um, what is feminism for you? Mm. I've got 10 minutes, bear, bear that in mind. <laughs> and um, how, how does that feed into your fiction? Like, what, what are you doing with that in your stories? A great question. I mean, I think that primarily uh, what I do is write the stories of women and girls. Mm. Um, the fact that that is seen as, and sometimes described as feminist fiction is, somewhat amusing to me, but, but you know, that, that is what I do. Um, I think particularly in The Hummingbird Effect, I wanted to look at also um, the idea of, of kinship and caring among women. This book is for my, for my grandmother um, who died last year and who was raised in a, a household of women. Um, and, and I'm interested in, in that. And a, a friend, Penny Russon, who did an, a, an event with me, was talking about the idea that often as writers we're, we talk about the fact that uh, novels revolve around conflict or story revolves around conflict, but that to invert that and to say that a novel revolves around care mm. is in some way seen as a, a, a feminist act. Um, I, I think also that I've had some very funny questions about the lack of nice men in my books, mm. um, which is amusing to me. And in fact, my, my publisher, um, Ben, um, of the of the you know charming Slaughterman Jack who who Peggy falls in love with in 1933. At one point he said, "Kate, I mean, can you just give him a little bit more behind him?" And I was like, "He just doesn't have it, Ben. Like this is just who he is." Um, and that's not you know he had to be charming and delightful um, for Peggy to fall for him, as I as I know that that readers do as well before he he turns. Um, and it's not I mean. Some of my best friends are men. It's just <laughs> that they don't necessarily make it into, into this book. And I love it when, when people, and, you know, particularly uh, a lot of schools study skylarking, and skylarking is really about the um, relationship between two young women and, and best friendship and kind of um, coming of age and sexuality. Uh, and one of the greatest pieces of feedback I ever get on my work mm. is from young women who say, you know, I saw myself in this, yeah. in this girl who lives in a lighthouse in 1888, but, you know, that, mm. that they saw themselves in that. Or similarly, for, for mums or parents who read Mim in The Motherfold and say, you know, yeah, that's how conflicted I felt. I, mm. I don't, didn't understand that I would at once want to be a parent and be with my kid at all times, run a million miles from them with, um, you know, paying... My daughter's in the front row, so not all the time. Um, you know, still, still want to be desired and still think about sex and, you know, all of this other stuff. Um, so I, I love when, when that stuff um, comes out for readers as well. Fantastic. Thank you. No, thank um, you. Now, do we have any questions from the floor? Come at me, I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. This is probably one of my favourite books of the year. Um, and so I'd, I'd recommend everybody uh, go out and buy it and read it. The way you've described it, you know, can make it sound like it's quite complex because it is experimental. There's a number of stories. But it was so readable and, for me, very optimistic. Mm. It is almost like your... Um, you're celebrating humanity and the persistence of humanity through time and through change. And I was just wondering if you could talk to that. Thank you, Pip. Um, yes, I can talk to that. And I did want this idea of, of optimism. And one of the things that I spent a lot of time 
reading and looking into was the idea of, it doesn't sound optimistic, but hear me out, of mm. post-human landscapes. Um, and I, I read a few books and uh, Attenborough also talks about it in, in the, the last kind of thing that he produced, is this idea of how quickly in places where the humans leave for whatever reason, um, how quickly nature comes back and that it does, you know, how quickly a, a bridge will fall, how quickly... Uh, plant life will come back through concrete. Um, and I think that that is something to, you know, to, to really hold on to and something I wanted to look at. And I also think, you know, I use an epigraph from uh, Lydia Yuknovich's excellent book, Thrust. Uh, she's a US writer. Um, and with permission, I used it. The, the line is, you can't kill the future in us. And it's from the children uh, protagonists in her book. And I think that one of the things, you know, Maz and Onyx in the last part of the book are really written for my, for my daughters. Um, and that, that idea of the, the, the fight uh, and the hope uh, that, that kids have particularly and that kind of eye-rolling ridiculousness, they look at us adults often and like, what are you lot doing? Like, <laughs> are you sitting on your hands? Or, you know, why haven't you, you done something about this? Um, you know, I think there's great optimism in, in that as well. Mm. Um, on the other part, which I would like, thank you for your feedback, the idea of it um, sounding complicated, which I get, it does. I promise you, what I tried to do was to re write a book that, yes, was complicated, but also read a little bit like Leanne Moriarty, that you could, you know, you could power through it. Mm. Because I think the other thing that, you know, us writers are really trying to be respectful of at the moment is your time as readers and the fact that, um, you know, your phone is, is sitting there at any point and has got a thousand million <laughs> stories in it that you could be looking in at any one time. Um, but I want to read the books and I want to write the books that mean it's, it's 11 o'clock and you've had the last cup of tea and you know you should be turning off the light, but mm. you just give yourself one more chapter um, and that mm. that is the kind of sweet spot as well for, for readers um, and certainly for me as a reader that I just... I have to give it one more, which mm. is, is what I want to do. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Hi, Kate. Um, thank you so much. This, I agree with Pip, is one of my favourite books that I've read this year and so far the top. Um, mm. I would love to know a little bit more about the creation of the diagram, how you came to do that. Was there a point where you thought, no, I'm done, I'm not going to put it in? Um, and also how you came up with it being called the hummingbird effect? Okay, two great questions. I'm gonna, I can't believe I still haven't um, flagged. So this is the diagram in the book, thank you. Is that Mel Review's books? <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, so this is the diagram. I did not do this diagram. And, and one of the extraordinary things I think, um, you know, writing is, can be such a solitary process, but then you get to the end part and, and, or any part. I do a lot of interviews, I do a lot of research and it's so collaborative. And I worked with a young woman called Eva Harbridge from Sydney, who's a visual designer who just happens to have expertise in both ethical AI and a love of spec fic. And we had what I've been describing as a brain affair over Zoom for, for three weeks when I literally handed her uh, a list of all the things that I was interested in for this algorithm. So Bayesian probability, the diagrams of Paul Clay, uh, philosophy that I'd been looking at, adjacent possible, like pictures of leaves that I'd picked up, like really random stuff. Uh, and she did a full design process with three different options, um, looking at how to put this diagram together. And you do kind of need a magnifying glass to, um, to get in there and look at some of the... Um, the phrases that I've got in there and the different ideas. But what was extraordinary about it, and I'm actually, I'm on leave from my PhD, but I'm trying to do my PhD on this, is that the creative process of having someone in a different creative field reflecting my work back to me while I was still in the middle of creating it, um, it was unlike anything I've ever had before. So it wasn't like an editor. Um, it wasn't even like a beta reader. It was that she was saying, this is what your work looks like to me and the, the meaning that I take from it in a visual sense. And um, when she sent through the final thing, I just wept. Like, I, I just wept that she had been able to, getting teary just thinking about it, um, kind of 
pull together this idea and, and make something so beautiful um, with these random ideas that had come out of my head. Uh, and I kind of want to do it for every book. Not that I want to put a diagram in every book, but you know, the idea of, well, imagine if I had someone dance it back or the mm -hmm. stereo stories last mm -hmm. night, you know, having someone put music to your work, how, how incredible. Um, the Hummingbird Effect is directly from the work of Stephen Johnson, who's another person I'd highly recommend that people go out and read. He's a US um, writer and thinker. He runs the TEDx podcast now. Uh, and he's written a book called How We Got to Now, which is six innovations that changed the world. And, uh, you know, the light bulb being one, or, or the concept of light, uh, the water pump being another. And the idea of the hummingbird effect as, as different from the butterfly effect is that the butterfly effect is about chaos and, and kind of the idea that the butterfly's wing flapping over there and the storm over there can't be charted. The hummingbird effect very specifically refers to the idea that the innovation can be tracked, uh, that one in innovation in one area, say the introduction of a chain in the meatworks, can have um, extraordinary repercussions in completely other areas of life. Um, and so that idea seemed to really resonate with what I was looking at about these, these little changes or what seemed like little changes at the time. Um, the changes in the Amazon factory, the idea of bringing in robots to do the work, which, you know, Booktopia is, has already got lots of places to. Um, th those, that one innovation is going to have extraordinary repercussions in, in other areas. So that's what that refers to. Thank you. Mm. Great question. Um, th thanks for that question and uh, yours too, Pip. That's us out of time, sadly. Um, I've got a what about your other four pages? I know, I know. We'll be at the bar. No, we I'll, won't. I'll, I'll email you. Um, a couple of quick things to mention. So right after this, in this room, is Living, Breathing Poetry with Joel McCarrow. So uh, it's a soulful Sunday session of poetry, and it's free, so stick around. Following that, we have Pip Williams discussing um, her new novel uh, and her previous novel too, I think, uh, with Jason Steger. Um, I looked on the app and it said it's sold out, but I don't know, try and squeeze in. We can make it a happening. Um, <laughs> you know, cl climb over the barricades to come to that one. That's at 3 p.m. and that will conclude the festival. Um, Kate will very kindly be out there at a table signing books, probably answering questions. Always. Um, and yes, in the meantime, please put your hands together for Kate Mildenhall. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.